Thomas Green here with Ethical Marketing Service. On the podcast today, we have Karen Liebengut. Karen, welcome. Hi. Very glad, you like to be here. glad to have you. Would you like to take a moment and tell the audience a bit about yourself and what you do? Yeah, sure. So I, uh, I live and work in London. I'm a, an accredited life and leadership coach, and I'm also an accredited mindfulness teacher. And so, yes, I offer coaching, life coaching, coaching for leaders, people in leadership roles. And my speciality is, if you like, I take my clients out into nature, tapping into the benefits uh, of nature on our well-being, mental health. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I did want to ask one thing, which is um, I, I sort of viewed it like a, a USP. So um, differentiation in terms of like, there's lots of coaches, but I view that, um, you know, going out into nature and walking as, as very much a unique selling point for you. Um, I don't know, what do you make of that? And um, what, what do you find is the difference between coaching generally, like you would over a Zoom call and then coaching, walking with someone in nature? Yeah, it's a great question. Um... What's different is I think that it creates more space for clients to explore uh, what's happening for them, what's happening in their lives. Clients often say they feel freer walking alongside me rather than sitting opposite me face to face or online. They also say it's easier to walk or be in silence and to process uh, experience or to process what's going on or to think about a question I ask them. And that there is more um, grounding going on in nature. So it's a much more embodied experience. That's also my own experience as a coach. I feel much more present when I coach clients in nature because when we are outside, we are immediately connected to all of our senses. All our senses are ignited. We're connected to the earth that's right there, a solid and present, and the sounds of birds around and the color green surrounding us. So immediately it has an effect on our parasympathetic nervous system. That's really all about feeling safe and secure and present. So it has huge benefits and it's also very enjoyable. I, I love being outdoors. It's when I'm at my best. Well, about halfway through the answer, I started to feel a little bit relaxed as you were talking. So <laughs> good. Uh, I was Without gonna, being outside. <laughs> I was going to follow up um, regarding what the outcome is. So um, I think well-being is is probably I would I would expect to be your driver for 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 doing it. I would imagine, um, but in terms of like if if the person was looking for an for an outcome. Um, I think you touched upon something which was, I mean, if you feel that you are going to do a better job as a coach, that way may well be enough of an outcome. But what would you say the outcome is if you were to say to someone, you know, the difference between, you know, what I do and what a normal coach does, what's that outcome going to be for them? Yeah, I think I, I need to say here that very good coaching happens online or in a room. Because the work as such, the exploration of an issue or feeling stuck with something in, in one's life. But I think what's different is um, the conditions that nature creates. It's, it creates a bigger space. And also, I think it creates, um, for some people who find it intimidating to meet someone and to sit opposite someone and to be asked questions and to explore some very personal things in their life. Nature gives a bigger space where experience can be held. And so some people find the process of change more supportive outside. And that's what I witness. So the outcome as such is the same, I would say, but perhaps outdoors, what I witness in some, um, some clients People get to it eat more more easily and quicker, perhaps, with more ease and creativity and freedom and trust in a way in the process. And get better answers as well, you said. Yeah, yeah. 
Interesting. More inside, more sort of aha moments, I would say, and more perhaps greater depth. Well, um, we talked briefly before the episode, and one of the things we wanted to talk about was um, the difference between doing versus being. Um, would you like to sort of um, define uh, what you mean by that? Yeah, it's, it's really a topic um, I feel quite passionate about and personally very interested in because I used to suffer from too much doing mode in my own life many years ago when I worked for a big corporate client uh, in my previous career as a film translator and subtitler. And I think it drove me to the edge of burnout being, you know, in doing mode really most of my time. And since I've uh, started coaching and particularly my mindfulness work and own practice has led me to understand more fully what it actually means to be in doing mode most of the time and how we need to bring in more de- being mode and mindfulness practice can help us increase being mode. So doing mode really means being on all the time. So having to-do lists, getting one job done after the next, thinking about the next thing while still doing one job. And being mode is very much about um, resting, going for a walk, sleeping as part of doing mode, but restful sleeping, or having a, a, an enjoyable conversation with someone, spending time in nature. All of these activities are being mode activities where we don't have any agenda, uh, where we don't want anything or need to do something or achieve something. And often in our day-to-day busy life, uh, the balance between doing and being mode get out of kilter. And we, we experience stress as a result and overwhelm. What would you say the differences are um, doing versus being versus sort of work versus leisure? Because it, it just makes me think, when you, when you describe doing, I just thought, you know, that's basically work. People are working too much. And then the being, I think, and it might be a bit simplistic, but perhaps when people are doing what they want to do, they're, they're doing the things that you perhaps were referring to. Um, is there differences there that you see? Yeah, I mean, when we are in doing mode, we often are at work, but work can take different forms and shapes when we, when we do voluntary work. Many people do voluntary work and overdo it because they have a, you know, a, an addiction, uh, an urge to be busy all the time. So we can get, you know, we doing more takes different forms, whether it's work, paid work or voluntary work, or when we care for someone, carers can very much be in, in doing mode and overdo it and suffer from burnout. And being mode can be leisure. Often it's connected with leisure, but being mode can also happen between two tasks. So when I uh, go from one job to the next or between clients, being mode can happen within 10 or 15 minutes and just sitting without looking at my phone. I often in the park when I, I'm between clients, I just sit and look at the lake we have, which is very ple- pleasant, of course. Um, but sometimes I need to resist the urge of looking at my phone and maybe you know getting an email done or replying to a text message that's immediately doing more. But we can create a little bit of being more time between two things, two tasks, two jobs, or just by slowing down, uh, going to the toilet, for example, that's a good ex- uh, a way of bringing in a bit of being mode when we yeah, go to the bathroom and just we can slow down a little bit and take a bit more time washing our hands. That's a bit of being more time, if you like. You touched upon um, the person who is perhaps addicted to being, uh, to the doing, so just active all the time. Why do you think that occurs? And what would you, what advice would you give that person? I think it's a habit. 
when we get addicted to work as we are addiction or you, me using being addicted to work is quite a strong term but I think it is what happens when whenever we have a, an urge to do something and not being able to do something different to to make a different choice in that moment we may be aware of working too much but we can't quite help it so that's a habit an unhelpful habit of working doing achieving wanting and the good news is habits can change we now know from neuroscience that the brain is plastic that we can change habits that neural pathways that formed and form habits it's like a groove literally it's a groove in the brain actually it's like the needle of a record player <laughs> for those who remember um, records and record player it's when the needle of a, a record player gets stuck in a tune so that's how we can imagine habits so it's repeated behavior uh, that happens unconsciously but the good news is that it can change we have to become aware of it and bring some kindness to it when we notice it and begin to take a breath in that moment when we experience that urge to do more to pause to breathe and that's the moment when we can actually make a different choice and change a habit. I do often ask um, guests uh, about, let's say, when, when you're advocating a particular uh, activity, um, they're an expert in that particular thing because they went through it themselves. And you, you mentioned your corporate job and approaching burnout. Um, do you want to go into perhaps um, a description of that? and? What was it that actually made you change if you were in the, uh, if you were do in the doing mode? What made a change was me taking up coaching with a coach and realizing that I needed to change my life. But what happened at the time was that um, the workload um, I was facing in my then job was very high, which often happens. And that is an issue. That's an external condition that we often can't change. But my part in it was that I had a belief that I need to do everything in order to uh, be good, perform well, to keep my job. So I got into that rut race, really, uh, in my job of thinking that I have to do everything, which is not really true when we look at it. Uh, more closely in in no job we have to do everything because it's impossible uh, to do lists are endless and that's the nature of the flow of work so it's the relationship we create to work that we bring to it and that is uh, that that is really rooted in our conditioning and habits uh, in our work ethics I come from a family with very high work ethics so that doesn't help so resting or taking breaks wasn't really on, if you like, or being ill. So the way it manifested was that I, um, I, I got into working very long hours, 10, hour, 10 hours or more, uh, even sometimes at the weekend, and then also not switching off, thinking constantly about work at the weekend. And I started to sleep badly not very well and not uh, long enough waking up early in the morning feeling very tired and feeling more and more tired and more exhausted so exhaustion is really when we are uh, when we run on empty when there's not very much left and when also the good stuff in our life drop off the agenda so being in nature was dropping off my agenda meeting friends and we go into this mindset of not having time to do these things that are good for us that all of a sudden feel like an indulgence so work becomes the the sole focus and when we do that over a period of time we do burn out and it's very unpleasant and leads to exhaustion and depression in the end well, you went into perhaps some of the things the agenda as you said my, my next question was going to be, 
if you could coach Karen during that particular scenario, mm-hmm. what would you, what advice would you give her? Or what, what would you have said to her? But I guess excluding the making sure that you get time for the what's important on the agenda. Yeah. Um, what would I say to her to spontaneously to take a break and that it's okay to take a break and that, you know, we can't run um, at that level of working all the time. But, you know, being a coach, I know that that doesn't always work when we say or give advice. We do, as a person, have to come to it um, from our own experience. So what I would say is to give myself permission to take a break. So it has to come from the person and really understanding that it's okay to work less. And physiologically, that it's impossible to work in that way uh, of not never pausing or stopping that it's unsustainable. So sometimes that's really helpful for people to understand that at the physiological level, the body can't sustain and the brain can't sustain doing all the time. What are your thoughts on the people who say, you know, I can work extremely long hours, um, you know, working all the time just because I love it. So um, have you got any takes on that? Yeah, I mean, that might be true um, for some people. And I would say I'm probably someone who likes to work and I often work long hours. I think what we need to understand is that that is not the issue. It's more, is this sustainable long term? Is this sustainable long term? I just, I think, want to bring in, I'm just thinking of a very helpful model that the psychologist Paul Gilbert has simplified for us. And this comes from uh, evolutionary neuroscience. And in this model that um, helps us to understand our emotional life better and what we need to have a balanced life and to to enjoy our life and and to feel resourceful. This model has three categories. And the first one is called the protection or threat system. That's all about protecting ourselves from threat or danger. And when we are in that system, when something happens that threatens us, the fight or flight uh, response is triggered in us. And the second system in this model is the thrive or drive system or resource seeking system, if you like. And this is all about our natural need to thrive, to do well, to achieve things. And that includes working or doing voluntary work. So we need that to be well, to thrive, to contribute in life. And then the third system in this model is the contentment or soothing system. And that's all about being, not wanting anything, not having an agenda, leisure, connecting with others, playing, having fun. So Paul Gilbert with this model really helps us to understand that we need all three systems to be well and to maintain good mental health uh, and to enjoy life long-term and to thrive. But often many of us operate in the drive system and threat system. And that is really what long term undermines our immune system, our well being, our joy. So and we often spend very little time in the contentment system, which is all about connecting and resting with restoring. So um, I think that can be be very helpful to understand long term, we are talking, you know, uh, it's okay to want to work and love work but how do we do it and how do we balance it with what else we need yeah it's a good point and I think at least my perception is that it's probably a habit like you were referring to so um 
you know, once once a habit working all the time, for example, becomes normal and you adjust to that, then, you know, that's going to be normal for you and you can say you're happy with it. But I guess if if you if you don't and it comes back to something which you mentioned a moment ago, which was the other things fall off in life. And um, if you if you get to the end of your life, for example, and you realize that all you've got behind you is work and everything else is not really present, then and I think, do you think that's a problem? Yeah, it is. I think it's it's interesting. I I've recently had a few clients um, who said to me, you know, more in their late fifties, that who said to me, I wish I had worked less in my life. Looking back now. I wish I had worked less. I think we often discover more in our midlife how important it is to um, pursue our passions, our interests, and that work is actually not the whole of our life. Like friendships, for example, many people neglect friendships and in later life they realize, oh, I wish I had spent more time maintaining my friendships or um spending time with friends making time for friends uh, in that in that respect I, I think it is an issue yeah and i also wanted to say a thing which has to do with our culture and society often working a lot or being busy or being stressed even is overrated or even misinterpreted as doing well you know, as, oh, you, you know, you must be busy, you must have a lot of work, you must be really good at what you're doing, you must be performing well. I think that that is, um, for many people, uh, confusing, I guess, in the way we view stress or being uh, in doing mode all the time. Yeah, there's a difference between being busy and being productive. Yeah, very much. And I think that's often confused. You mentioned um, passion or finding your passion. Any thoughts on, let's say, if you spoke to someone who didn't have a passion and was looking for one, how they might go about finding that? I often ask people, many people find it hard because of being in the doing more too much, find it hard to connect to their passion, but we all have passions. We all know deep inside what makes the heart sing and um, enjoy life. I often ask people what they enjoyed when they were a kid. And people know immediately what they loved when they were young, you know, because we all uh, did things when we were kids, most of us, you know, that we really loved, uh, you know, playing in the forest or with the kids or painting or playing in the mud or, you know, building sand castles on the beach, you know, whatever it is, you know, or doing all sorts of mischievous things <laughs> like I did. <laughs> and often that re reconnects people with their passion. I had a client who reconnected with her love of playing the tr trumpet. And it turned out that she had not touched her trumpet for 30 years and that it had been sitting on top of her cupboard for all, the, all those years. And she got all excited and a bit scared of, you know, taking the instrument into her hands again, but she did it. And that became, you know, her new passion or renewed passion. So it's there. And I think we need to be in the being mode to reconnect with passion. We need to go to places we love and sit and listen. It doesn't happen when we are in being mode up in the head, in the more conceptual mode of thinking that we can reconnect to passion. Passion is in the body, is in the heart. What would you say your passion is? Nature. Really spending time in nature. So I often go on my own. I call these solitary walks or days. I take myself on a walk in my own good company. And I love it. I, I'm the happiest person, really, um, when I go to my favorite places like the South Coast uh, in England, the South Down, sitting or walking. 
sort of overlooking the sea, that's when I have my best ideas or feel most, you know, most present and grounded and all is well, sort of, you know, with that feeling and mindset. Yeah, and I also love, um, I love spending time with good friends, sort of ideally in a one-to-one -one scenario when there's, uh, you know, and ideally while walking where I, I feel there's always a flow of connection and exchange and listening to, to one another and coming away feeling really nourished by that. Well, I can sort of see how you've engineered your, your professional <laughs> life here. <laughs> Have you said you've done a, a good job of mixing the passion with the profession? That's right, yeah. I mean, um, it can't get any better, I think. Um, and the idea of taking my clients on a walk in nature happened on a walk in nature. Uh, when I all of a sudden thought, gosh, you know, this is what I need to do rather than sitting inside. That's how I started my coaching practice, inside, in the consultation room. Rather than doing that, I can do it where I most feel alive and at my best. And that's how it started, yeah. I can sort of imagine like lots of different, um, should we say, niches um, coming up as a result of this. So like people watch this and you think, you know, maybe I could be a coach of running. Uh, I'll coach people while going around the track or I'll coach people while skiing or something. Have you ever, have you seen any of those types of examples or not? I haven't. I would say coaching clients while walking needs to have a or doing any other activity needs to have a fair amount of being mode in it i think it's hard to go skiing down a slope or <laughs> running and having that sort of space for you know thinking uh, to process or for taking a new perspective of things. I think it needs a certain amount of slowing down to do the inner work, to really connect to what's happening, what the issue is. So coaching while doing Formula One racing is gonna be out then? I think so, yes. Sorry, but there are many being mode activities, which is interesting in itself, yeah, being mode activities. So this is actually important. Being mode doesn't mean doing nothing. Being mode means slowing down a bit, creating some space, and most importantly, not having an agenda. So coaching in a way has no agenda. It's an exploration. Of course, there's an agenda around what people bring and what they want to get out of it, which is always held as an overarching frame. But the coaching session itself has no agenda, which makes it so, um, effective some coaches don't actually um give advice as a rule so it's kind of like the the exercise of attempting to get you to the come to the answer yourself um do you ever step into the shoes of someone who would give advice or is it all um you know helping the other person get those answers on their own yeah it really is what makes a good coach to stay in the questioning mode question mode I sometimes ask a client, you know, can I say something or can I make a suggestion? So it's important to ask permission if someone wants it. Often people do, but it's not very often needed to make a suggestion. I think it's often um, that we think, you know, our advice might be the most helpful thing, which very rarely is the case. And it's often also the most annoying thing we can do to anyone to give advice and um, because it's often not what works for us. It's very individual. And when people find out what works for them, it's much more satisfa uh, satisfactory and works uh, as a way forward. Have you got any um, coaching examples that you're particularly proud of? Well, one is the client who I'm, I'm really happy I, I just remember that the client with the trumpet and who started playing her instrument again that was just wonderful really magical 
and other examples are, let me have a little think. Um, usually it's, it's what is most rewarding is when people really begin to do what they most love doing. Yeah, I have another client who um, wanted to reconnect with her uh, love for gardening and landscaping and she hadn't done it for a while because of having children and feeling underconfident of doing it again after having stayed at home and we explored it and and worked out her next steps what she could do to reconnect with uh, her profession what she really wanted to do and she did it so she's now back in her landscaping, gardening profession, doing it part-time, not full-time anymore, and seeing her so fulfilled in it and, and satisfied that she actually had the confidence to do it again was very rewarding. I think, um, correct me if I'm wrong, you'd be an advocate of, um, even if someone was to, let's say, not take up coaching at this time, um, but you'd still sort of encourage them to get out into nature um, every day. Why is it that you think that it's it, it's a simple thing, you know, going out for a walk, but why do you think we need so much encouragement or reminding to go and do it? I think we have lost uh, touch with the benefits of nature. We've um, disconnected, I think, from our place of origin. We, we come from nature, we are part of nature. I think our urban and busy lifestyles have somehow alienated us from that sense of being interconnected with all life. And I think that is why we need so much reminding that nature is good for us. Uh, and we are, as human beings, and with the untrained mind, very easily distracted by, you know, social media, by what's going on, um, what's going on elsewhere or in the house, on the family or on the news or, you know, searching the internet for something to keep us busy. So that's the, the monkey mind, the mind that constantly sort of needs to hook onto something. So that's, that's really a result of our busy lives um, and technological lives. And Ian McGilchrist, um, he's a neuroscientist and philosopher and psychologist. He talks of our three great estrangements. And the first one is our disconnection with the natural world. And he, at the, in, the, in the same sort of sense, he talks about our three great longings. And the first great longing is to reconnect with the natural world, to have experiences that connect us with the natural world. And I find that very interesting. Um, and when we look at how we lived just 200 years ago, um, which was very different and much more in close connection with nature, and many more of us lived in cl close connection to nature um, than today. Well, you mentioned social media um, and the phone as well. Are you purposeful about how much you get access to that kind of stuff? Yeah, I am. And it's a constant practice. You know, my mind also likes to look at my emails and, and um, particularly LinkedIn. So I've reduced my social media channel to one, which is LinkedIn. And I also don't have any notifications anymore on my phone because somehow when there's a little sound I have no sounds anymore on my phone so when there's a sound or a little red um you know symbol telling me there's a message my mind also wants to go there when I'm not aware um, so I have to work with it every day and I try not to to have a sort of social media device free time before eight o'clock so I like to get up early and that's between six and eight is my my time my being time being more time when I do yoga and meditate or just sit with my coffee and um, not look at anything so that starts at eight and my lunch break I 
try mostly keep free, keep device free. Sounds relaxing. I, um, years ago, I decided to make sure that my phone wasn't allowed to alert me um, in any way. So it's always on vibrate for me. But um, it does mean I'm not very good at answering my phone. But, you know, oh, well, <laughs> never mind. Yeah, but how good do we really need to be at answering our phone? I think there's also an expectation now that we need to be really quick. Or if we don't do it within the two hours, something is wrong with us or something has happened to us or we are not good at replying, you know, instantly. So I think we, we can also relax a little bit around how available do we need to be or how important are we? I think we take ourselves a little bit too seriously sometimes <laughs> and too importantly. <laughs> well, I think um, you've, you're a pretty good example of that in the sense that you kind of set the terms of how you want your life to be and then people work around it because that's um, that's kind of what, what your preferences are. But maybe some people just don't set their preferences and they kind of work to other people's expectations. Do you think that's true? That's absolutely true. That's an issue all the time in my coaching work with clients, wanting to fulfill expectations of others. And the view, the self-view, that if we don't meet other people's expectations, that um, we let people down or they judge us. Uh, but really, we judge ourselves when we don't meet those expectations. And I think that's really important in our personal work we can do for ourselves to free ourselves from those expectations, which are simply, most of the time, not true and don't happen. Most people are far too busy with themselves and thinking about the expectations they have on, on us. You know, we are busier, you know, working with our own expectations. In a way, that's a that's a that's an expectation we put on ourselves when we want to meet other people people's expectations, because often we don't even know what other people's expectations are. You know, unless we ask them, is this what you expect of me? And people often would probably say, what do you mean? Yeah. Like you say, they're too busy thinking about the expectations for them. Uh, it's yeah. a good point. Um, is there anything which you think would be of value to the audience <laughs> on this particular topic, which I haven't asked you about today that you think would be valuable? Yeah, what we've just talked about, you know, the... Um, I think I want to encourage everyone, and this is my ongoing practice. I haven't mastered it, you know, um, working out my own preferences and having healthy expectations of myself and also giving, giving ourselves permission to be more. That doesn't mean to be lazy or self-indulgent, but truly to be more and to enjoy enjoy life more rather than being driven by achieving and thinking we need to do all the time. I think it makes such a big difference in our life, even if we just bring in a little bit more of that. Good answer. I'm, always, I'm interested to know what you're going to say to this question because I ask it on every episode. And that is, um, what are your goals? So do you have goals in the, in the traditional sense? I don't really like goals. But I, I'm aware um, that somehow we need goals. I'm more a person that talks about purpose in life because I feel it's, it's a more holistic approach to having aspirations in life, which I think is really necessary to uh, keep us alive and um, having a purpose, which for me is um, making a positive difference or contribution to mental health and well-being. I'm going to do a bit of verbal gymnastics here. Have you uh, got anything that you're working towards at the moment which will give you more purpose in your life?
Yeah, there are several things. That's probably why I'm hesitating. So my ongoing practice is to um, spend more time in the contentment zone to have yeah, coming back to the three emotional systems I talked about. So constantly or keeping a good level of being mode activities uh, through regular meditation, spending time in nature, getting out, getting out of London, going on retreats. So it's an ongoing uh, practice for me to bring it in and to make time for it and to take time off and particularly in lockdown, it's been one of my greatest challenges to um, not overwork because I had so much work and I really needed to be on the ball to allow myself to be my own good and kind boss, if you like. That's probably, here we go, here's my purpose after having waffled for a moment here. I've said this a few times, becoming my own kind boss, which I think I, we all have to do, you know, whether we, we are self-employed or not, but people who are self-employed, I think need to become their own good and kind boss. Well, you certainly don't want to be an unkind boss to yourself, do you? No, absolutely not. But maybe but you've good, experienced that before, right? Yeah, I have actually, I have. I've gone through being very driven and um, it doesn't work. Long term, it doesn't work. Karen, thank you very much for the calming conversation today. <laughs> Would you, um, where's the best place for people to find you? To go to my website, uh, greenspacecoaching.com. Everything is on there. Okay, thank you very much. Mm, thank you.